scoop on the best tasting coffee. Let Consumer Reports take the guesswork out of shopping. Call now. Get 13 issues, including the famous auto issue. Only $26. If not satisfied, cancel and owe nothing. It's risk-free. And as a bonus, with your paid subscription, you'll get How to Clean Practically Anything, plus the Buying Guide 2001. Both free. Don't gamble with your time and money. Call now, 800-650-1011. That's 800-650-1011. For Consumer Reports. Tomorrow on 100 Center Street. You're under arrest. Hey, Shut on here! My client was flanked. They're skating on very thin ice. No more secrets. He, he was found at a crack house. If they're gonna fire me, why don't they just fire me? I feel like I'm lost in a fun house. No more lies. What is the setup? You've got to get a hold of yourself. Back off, Joe. I want you to find and arrest him. If you don't find him, I will. Only the truth. Don't give them any more ammunition! We'll set them free. You've got to get rid of this truth. Every. It's going to break your heart. Reckless. Open the stage to the Act. They broke the law. Has its price. I think you should back off. Are you threatening me? On an all-new 100 Center Street. Tomorrow on A&E. A&D Home Video proudly presents 100 Center Street, the feature-length premiere episode for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-423-1212 or shop online at and.com. A&D, escape the ordinary. It used to be the models that were the superstars. Then word got out about the designers. Biographies going off the rack and inside the stories of some of my favorite designers. Armani, Vera Wang. What most of us considered a hall, my wife considers a closet. Halston, Calvin Klein, and Edith Head. Superstar Designers Week on Biography starts tomorrow on a and &E. Biography Close-Up, brought to you in part by Remicade. From a and &E, this is Biography Close-Up. For March 18, 2001, Biography Close-Up with Harry Smith, Sesame Street. Good evening. I'm Harry Smith. Tonight on Biography... Oscar the Grouch. Excuse me. I'm Harry Smith, and Oscar, no, tonight we are not doing your biography. Drat. But we are doing something I think you will find particularly interesting. Smith, would you just take your deep, resonant voice and scram? Hang on a minute. Let me explain. Tonight on Biography, we go to Sesame Street. We'll go to some places you've never been and meet some folks maybe even you do not know. Oh, be still, my beating heart. I can't wait. You don't have to. Oh. It looks like any other bare and basic conference room. But as every child knows, you can't judge a book by its cover or a room by its simplicity. All right, this is the uh, May 23rd year 2000 meeting of the writers at Sesame Street. And we're going to be ourselves today. <laughs> at 11.20, we're all going to break into a fistfight over the concept of cooperation. <laughs> This is kind of an annual rite of spring, when the writers sit down to discuss the shape of shows for the coming season. The storm comes to Sesame Street, and everybody goes inside, and they're protected, and we see a shot of the nest outside, and the wind is blowing, and papers are blowing. The head writer, Lou Berger, thinks one of the highlights of Sesame Street 2001 will be a week of shows when Sesame Street is forced to rebuild after a hurricane hits the neighborhood. The shows will help teach kids about friendship and fear, about loss and recovery. The second show we come out and Big Bird goes to check his nest and it's not there. It's just some twigs. It's been blown away. 
My home! My nest! It will be nearly a year before this show is finally finished and on the air. But this is where it all begins, with these men and women, the parents in a sense, who bring so much of Sesame Street to life. To so many of us, Sesame Street seems so familiar. We grew up watching Big Bird, and Kermit, and Susan, and Bob, and Maria, and Mr. Hooper. But what we tend to forget is just how many years Sesame Street has been around. I want to count backwards. Okay, count backwards for me. Three. Three? Three? Uh, and two. Two, two. Let me finish it up, okay? Let me, the, the, the last one is... Uh, what's, what's the last one? I don't know. Well, Sesame Street has been around for more than 30 years born a long, long time ago in a place known as the 60s. It was a crack in time, a decade when anything seemed possible. I've seen the promised land. When all the old rules and all the old ways seemed to crumble away, and when the young seemed to hold sway. For the first time, Americans were able to witness everything that was happening around them. Not only in their own neighborhoods, but throughout the country, and even worlds away. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Television was bringing an entirely new universe into American homes. But it was bringing home little for the children of America. For the very young, for the toddlers of this turbulent time, there were only teaspoonfuls of anything you might call nutritious. Good morning. How are you this morning? Are you just as happy as you can be? But a revolutionary new show was about to change everything. All right, all right, then, all right. How about this for a title? The two and two are five show. Uh, that's not yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now, this is supposed to be an educational show. Two plus two don't make five. They don't. No, you meatball. Then how about the two and two ain't five show? Oh. It was February 1966. A documentary producer at New York City's public television station was about to set out on a journey along a thoroughfare of make-believe. She would become a Pied Piper who would lead millions of preschoolers through their ABCs and make learning fun. And it all happened quite by accident at a dinner party thrown by that documentary producer, Joan Gans Cooney. One of her guests was an official at the Carnegie Foundation, Lloyd Morissette, who was then trying to find ways to better prepare poor kids for school. The dinner had been going along, and then after dinner, during the conversation, it just struck me, Joan, whom I knew very well, was in television. And we had never thought of using television for the purposes of trying to reach young children. And something clicked in his mind. And I said to Joan, do you think television could be used to teach young children? Meaning letters, numbers, pre-reading, pre-math. And Joan's answer was, I don't know, but I'd like to talk about it. Hey, these kids can't read or write, can they? Mm -hmm. No. Uh -uh. Then how's about we call the show, Hey, Stupid? Everyone I talked to said, do it. Just do it. It was just amazing. Some kids had the advantage of growing up in homes with books and educated parents. And when they started kindergarten, maybe they already knew the alphabet. Maybe they could even count. But there were millions of children who grew up in disadvantaged neighborhoods, who started out life a step behind, and too often never had a chance to catch up. I suddenly saw that I could go on doing documentaries about poverty and the educational deficits that poverty created. I could do them forever and have no impact. And that I suddenly saw this could
could make a difference. That was the beginning, really, of Sesame Street. Oh, it sounds like it's going to be a real smash. Uh, what's the idea of this show? Well, the idea is to teach little preschool kids some stuff that'll be useful to them in school, like numbers and letters and like that. And your idea is that the kids are going to race in from baseball and turn on the educational TV channel to be taught letters and numbers. Hmm? <laughs> Go ahead. Now. Now. Oh. But they will, Kermit, because all the teaching stuff is mixed in with stories and cartoons and like that. Eight million dollars in grants, a huge sum at the time, came from foundations and from the federal government, earmarked for research and planning, and for the production of one season of this new show. An episode a day for 26 weeks, 130 shows in all. Joan Gans Cooney would head the production unit, the Children's Television Workshop, and would create a show unlike anything else on TV. I did say no magic house, no fantasy land. It has to be something real. And John Stone, one of the producers, came to me and said, I've been thinking, why don't we put this on an inner city street? And he always says, I paled <laughs> at the suggestion. <laughs> and then I said, John, if you think it will work, let's try it. So you paled when you... I Hailed when he said, what about an inner city street? <laughs> Want to see some of the little films that'll be in the show, Kermit? Mm. Okay, here's one to teach the alphabet. Late last week, a real old dog went out digging in a terrible fog, found some dice on a hollow log, and won a duck from a friendly frog. We're going to keep repeating them, Kermit, just like commercials on regular TV. Again and again until they sink in, you know? Oh, that's kind of a groovy idea, Ralph. Commercials for the alphabet. They must have some people who know what they're doing at the Children's Television Workshop. They got an advisory board of the best people in the country. The words here are very difficult, you know. The advisory board was made up of teachers, sociologists, child psychologists, and animators, all contributing ideas. The two boys are sitting there talking and kind of casually one boy says, What's happening, man? I don't know. What's that? I don't know. Looks like a fish hook. It's not a fish hook. It's a jay. A what? The consultants all had their own opinions on how to make learning fun, on how to maintain the intricate balance between education and entertainment. Once upon a time, a guy named Joe noticed a June bug on his toe. And the researchers would come back and say the J should not be in the upper right-hand corner. Children don't look up there. It has to be here or the lower left-hand corner. That's good. Every idea for the show was tested and tested again, not only to see if it would teach the preschoolers, but to see if it would entice them enough to keep them watching. I find that absolutely fascinating, that you would set the same standard for your segments that uh, cartoons had on Saturday morning in terms of the testing that would go in to make sure that kids would watch, that they would stick, stick with the show. Yes, well, there was no point in doing it and spending all this money if it weren't popular and it didn't hold the viewer's interest. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The money that was given to us was in order to make the show as popular as any commercial show on the air. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. To help make it popular, a trailblazing band of creative pioneers was recruited for the project. All intrigued by its revolutionary nature and by the promise that they could try virtually anything. A young filmmaker and puppeteer by the name of Jim Henson joined the staff. At the time, he was known for the zany and offbeat commercials he made. Want a cup of Wilkins coffee? What'll Mr. Wilkins do if I don't? Oh, he'll probably put his foot down. Joan Gans Cooney knew of Henson's work and admired it. I want the cheap stuff. Cheap, cheap, cheap. Sorry, but that other coffee is for the birds. Here, hold this. Oh, boy, he's a hot salesman. But she had never met him and was in for a surprise. 
we were having these seminars in ho various hotels, and I kept looking nervously over my shoulder for a man had walked in with a beard and sandals and a leather vest. And this was during the, the weather men were blowing up buildings. And so I started getting very nervous, and I whispered to Dave Connell, one of the producers, how do we know that man's not going to kill us? And he said, that's not likely. That's Jim Henson. By July 1969, after the staff was in place and after nearly two years of research, Sesame Street still had to find out how viewers at home would react to a completed show. Just one more test needed to be done. That's another D word. Dance. We put five test shows on, in, on a UHS station in Philadelphia and paid a hundred families to have their children watch. I think we paid them a hundred dollars each and we asked them if they liked it and it was, n did not work. So it was almost like you had a uh, out of town tryout. We did have you an You bombed in New Haven. We did. <laughs> or Philadelphia <laughs> as the Philadelphia. case may be. And uh, then had a chance to live again with a, yes. a better show. Yes. So uh, let's see now, we got the two eyes and two ears, and two noses. Hey, 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 you ding -a -ling. you've only got one nose. What would become the signature of Sesame Street was barely visible in the test shows. Too bad. Two puppets named Bert and Ernie went over really big with the audience, but they were the only puppets on the test shows. They were never seen on the street and did not interact with the human cast. If all that changed, and there were others like them in the forefront of Sesame Street, maybe the show would take off. An advisor had said, don't mix fantasy and reality. So as soon as we saw the, the test results, we said, let's mix fantasy and reality. It was that commercial maker who Joan Gans Cooney once mistook for a terrorist bomber who would obliterate the line between fantasy and reality and play a key role in transforming what might have been a dud into an explosive hit. His weapon of choice was not pyrotechnics, but a boisterous bunch of furry monsters. Hello there, my name is Jim Henson, and I'm a puppeteer. And I'm called a puppeteer because I work with puppets. And my own act, my puppet act, is called the Muppets. Jim Henson's Muppets were about to take up residence on Sesame Street and in the homes of millions of American families. It's Earth Television! Hello, Order. Mommy! Hello, Order. Mommy! Huh? Will Hi. you get out of here? I'm sorry. Thank you for allowing a monster into your living room. Biography Close-Up with Harry Smith. Sesame Street will continue in a moment on A&E. You led a full life. Then you were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. But there's new hope. A prescription drug that relieves pain and inhibits the progression of joint damage. It's called Remicade. Your doctor may prescribe Remicade if you are on methotrexate already and not responding well. You take one dose of Remicade every eight weeks after the first three doses. Of course, Remicade is not for everyone. Serious infections requiring hospitalization have been reported. If you are prone to or have a history of infections, currently have one, or develop one while taking Remicade, tell your doctor right away. There's a risk of serious infusion reactions with hives, difficulty breathing, and low blood pressure. Ask about Remicade and inhibiting the progression of joint damage. Honey, we're going to miss the ballet. It's supposed to be beautiful. Now, Smart Ones are going to bowl you over. Introducing delicious bowls from Smart Ones, like spicy Southwestern-style chicken. Smart Ones Bowls. When you're smart, it shows. Qu'est-ce que c'est? Un nouveau cabriolet. Très rapide. Très beau. Une merveille de la technologie. Totalement irrésistible. Une voiture qui stoppe le trafic. Le nouveau cabriolet de Lexus. Parlez-vous désir? Tomorrow on 100 Center Street. 
You're under arrest. Hey, Get out of here! My client was Frank. No more secrets. If they're gonna fire me, why don't you just fire me? No more lies. What's the setup? If you don't find him, I will. I think you should back off. Are you threatening me? On an all-new 100 Center Street. Tomorrow on a &E. She just doesn't understand. What's to understand? <sighs> what is that, Michael? Is that what you think I sound like? Yes. Mr. Doyle, do you use a cellular phone? What's come between you two is static. Here, Sprint PCS built the only all-digital, all-PCS nationwide network, so your calls are clear. Thank you. Sprint PCS, 1,200 minutes, all with nationwide long distance. Oh, hi. Yeah, are we still meeting today? Uh, yeah, well, I got all my investment paperwork together, uh, just like we talked about. Yeah, stocks, mutual funds, uh, IRAs, 401ks. I mean, you know, I really want to get together a good plan today. Well, in the area of planning, we have some of the most comprehensive tools in the industry for whatever you have. A fidelity, non-fidelity. Uh, I want to make sure that we're going to have enough time to cover all of it. Yes, of course. Sorry, it's not very organized. When we're finished, it will be. To review your portfolio, call, click, or visit Fidelity. Biography Close-Up with Harry Smith, Sesame Street, continues on a and &E. I wrote up some thoughts. I don't know where to really begin. But, uh... Meet Lulu, a Muppet trying to find herself, a character evolving. Okay, well, this, this is me, and um, I, I think that I'm about maybe four and a half. I think I'm kind of right between, you know, that, that little guy, Elmo, that funny, that crazy kid. And, uh, and, uh, between, uh, and then Baby Bear and Kelly, and they're, they're kind of older than me a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry, I got this little, got this little thing here. Got this little thing. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that the things that she says, I think she has a very innocent quality about her. She's just got a very open face, kind of ready for anything. Wor really? Oh, I'm, I, I, Show them that little stubborn yeah, yeah. face. <laughs> Like all Muppets, Lulu is a descendant of Jim Henson's early creations. The first sketch of Big Bird, when I look at it, is a very strange, you know, he looks nothing like that now. Fortunately, he looks much better. Sure he is. Hello, Big Bird. Oh, hi, Gordon. How are you? When the Sesame Street test shows failed, Jim Henson created a new Muppet called Big Bird. I like the idea of this large, silly, yellow thing walking around on the street. Big Bird, look up. Oh, oh, this oversized yellow fowl would change in time, becoming the Big Bird we now know. Uh, come on, Radar, let's go see. Uh, That's how it's always been with Jim Henson's Muppets. Like people, they are works in progress. It's been a long time since the first Muppet was created, and always the process has been the same. A concept is drawn, a puppet is built, a personality developed, and over time, refined. Hi there. My name is Hansel. You know, we uh, have a lot of fun playing with the character when we're developing a puppet. And we have here a southern colonel type character. He's a two-person puppet. And in this one, uh, I'm working the left hand and the head, and I'm working the right hand. Here's that sound. That right-hand man. Frank Oz, began working with Jim Henson in the early 1960s. He just exploded a puppetry. People accept it now as normal, but then it was like oh, brand new. And I'm wearing a fifth helmet because I just come back from Africa. You know, what, what did you I do was, in Africa? I was big game hunting in Africa, You fella. was big game hunting? Yes, indeed. Well, what game? Monopoly. The strange thing is, Jim Henson never intended on pursuing a career in puppetry. Instead, he was drawn to the medium that came of age when he did, in the 1950s. A medium that he would eventually transform. What originally drew my father to puppetry is television. He was completely intrigued by the medium of television. And so he went to the local television station in Washington, D.C. when he was 17 years old to get a job. And they said, well, you're too young. And he said, but he'll do anything. And so he saw a sign that said, Puppeteer Wanted. So he went to the local library. He got out some books on puppetry. He built himself some puppets. He went back to the local television station. And he said, now I'm a puppeteer. Will you hire me? <laughs> and, they, and so he got a job as a puppeteer. And that's how he got started in puppetry. That job 
didn't last long. After just two weeks, the junior morning show was canceled. But Jim and his wife, Jane, were soon working at another Washington station where they would remain for six years and make their reputation producing and performing a nightly five-minute show, Sam and Friends. The puppets that my mom and dad made in the 50s for the show Sam and Friends were the, the first puppets that were really made for the television camera. And so they, they had eyes that focused right into the camera. Their eyes stand out more than any other color on the character. They're white and black, and, and they focus, and they look at you. And it was always very important to have characters that their eyes are looking directly at the camera or at another character or whatever, so they can talk to you, and you really feel that they're talking to you. Good evening. I'm Ed Burrow, and the name of the show is Poison to Poison. They had mouths that moved with your thumb like this, so, so that they could open and close their mouths that to, to fit the words that were coming out to really make it look like the puppet is saying those words. Puppets would go like this, and until, until Jim, uh, they went like that, but then they started talking like that. Real lip sync for every word. Tonight, we're visiting the home of a very famous motion picture and television director. They called it the Henson Punch, and there was a move. Where it's really based on a person's own speech pattern. When you're talking quietly, you talk, your mouth opens less than when you talk. When you hit an emphasis word, the mouth hits harder, and it's kind of, you're punching that, that voice. Are you there, Alfred? Good evening, Ed, and welcome to my humble little sanctuary. Well, it had never been done before. It had never been done before because no one had actually thought to build puppets in a special way for this new medium of television. Brian, are you down there? I'm just looking for the television. Oh, there you are. They had taken puppets that were built for the theater and put them on television. The uh, platter they're playing on this TV show seems to have gotten stuck. Maybe if I just hit the television like this. And my father, he's coming up with new things. He's coming up with new ways of, of creating something just for the television audience. And now it's the Muppet. Actually, there are a lot of different kinds of Muppets. They come in all shapes and sizes. Some of us Muppets are very cute. Some of us are absolutely adorable. Some of us are ugly and we like it that way. Some of us even have more than one head. And you know what they say, three, three heads, heads are better, better than one. one. Uh, let me introduce you to a friend of mine. Here's Kermit. Hi there. Now, Kermit is also a Muppet. I most certainly am. Meet the original Kermit, made by Jim Henson in 1955. It's no wonder he now reclines in a rocking chair. The story goes that he built it out of his mother's green uh, spring coat, and that there's a rag bag of, of old materials, and there happened to be this old spring coat that was this wonderful texture. And uh, so he built the first Kermit out of that, and the eyes were made from a ping pong ball that he cut in half. Um, and again, just simple materials, but it's all about the character and the personality. So all you got is them little hands on sticks, see? Uh, keep your hairy paws off my sticks. You can't even pick things up. Uh, maybe not, but I know something I can do. What's that? <laughs> Ooh, ah, let go! The original Kermit wasn't actually a frog. The original Kermit was this abstracted character, and he was sort of a jazzy character, and he played off of this other character that was a real jazz guy. <laughs> And uh, the Kermit could take on different personalities. At one point, he actually wore a yellow wig and sang a song, which <laughs> is very funny. And, um, and, but over the years, he developed into a frog, and he gained a collar, and he gained webbed, a little, little webby feet, and, um, and he took on the name Kermit the Frog, as opposed to just Kermit. It's not that easy being green Having to spend each day the color of the leaves. My parents came up with this name, Muppet, because it was a funny, cute name. And some people say that they took the two words marionette, which is a string puppet, and puppet, and they put them together. But uh, we actually think that it's more that my father just thought it was a fun-sounding word. Phenomenon. Hello, Dad. This is your old pal, Grover. Well, hi all there. This is Kermit the Frog. Oh, Jim Henson would go on to create scores of Muppets specifically for Sesame Street. One, 
wonderful cow. After adding Muppets and fine-tuning the test shows, by the fall of 1969, Sesame Street was bursting with a sense of success. I remember the last days going around like a woman 10 months pregnant. I knew we had a baby, a great baby. You just felt it. Sesame Street was promoted heavily, at the time a rarity for public...